Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back again to the Siege of the Rax. After the expected and yet still disappointing failure of the 261st to make any real headway against the Vraxian Citadel, it was now time for Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex to implement his own master plan. But before we get into today's bout of slaughter, a quick and shameless plug for my own little Teespring store. I've started to finally update the various designs there, as I've been promising for a while, with the first one being designed by Ritualist. I'll have several more on the way from him, immortalizing various quotes of uh, dubious nature that I've spouted over the years. In this case, it's taken from Gravity Team Tactics, where, as I recall, I was digging a group of Soviet soldiers defending a small village out of their foxholes with guns. Many guns, and vast quantities of high explosive ammunition. Because frankly, there are no problems in this world that cannot be solved with the appropriate quantity of high explosives. Something that Lord Commander Zhulka, Marshal Arnim Kagori, and now also Lord Hector X is coming to realize. So, if you're interested, do go and have a look at them over on the Teespring store. If you're in the US, it probably pops up at the bottom of the video, or if not, there will be a link in the description. Now, pluggery aside, let us move on to Lord Hector Rex's plan. It has been said that the only thing more dangerous to an army than a commander who lacks belief in himself is a commander with far too much faith in his own abilities. And Lord Hector Rex's ego had been puffed up quite nicely by the successful operations previously in the campaign. It was under Lord Hector Rex's leadership that the second breach in the curtain walls was achieved, and with it the complete collapse of the last proper Vraxian defensive line, leading to the encirclement of the final Vraxian citadel and victory just within grasp. Lord Hector Rex had done quite well for himself, failure of the 30th Line Corps to secure the defeat of the Nurgle forces aside, he had advanced the campaign to the very threshold of ultimate victory. And to cross that final threshold, that last and most daunting of hurdles, the Lord Inquisitor had concocted a brilliant plan, which would require the cooperation of the various Inquisitors on planet, along with their retinues and agents, and of course, the participation of the Red Hunters Astartes, whose battle brothers were currently spread out amongst the various inquisitorial retinues as honor guards. These forces were to deliver the final decisive blow to the Vraxian Citadel, rending it open and exposing its innards to the Death Corps of Krieg, who would then flood in and take the last bastion of the Apostate Cardinal. That all certainly sounds very promising, and how precisely was this miracle to be achieved? Well, with a fair old bit of blood and guts as usual, of course, though this time the blood and guts would be provided not by the shattered 261st, but instead by the 269th, still of the 30th Line Corps. I don't know if Lord Hector X has a grudge against the poor bastards, or if he views this as some sort of an honor to keep throwing them at the Citadel, but I am sure the previous elements of the 261st that was rolled into the other line regiments in the 30th were happy to receive another crack at it. And seeing as this is the Death Corps of Krieg, yeah, they probably were. <laughs> Any other fucking regiment would be revolting right about now. So then, the great plan that was to secure victory against the heretics and finally end the war. The first phase would be carried out by the aforementioned 269th Line Regiment, and they would take a very different approach to that adopted by the 261st. Instead of attacking the Citadel from multiple directions in the hope of spreading the defenders out thin, the 269th would pursue a singular line of advance. The lead elements of the 269th, including armored support, would begin moving towards the citadel from the northwest, 
But before they could move in against the outer defenses, they first had to cross a small natural obstacle shown here. This was a gully running right across the 269th route of advance, but it was expected to be a relatively immaterial obstacle. Fairly shallow and occupied only by light enemy forces, it was expected to be overrun in a matter of hours. And once they had passed the gully, they would then attack and destroy the outermost defenses. These took the shape of a pair of twin armoured towers, surrounded by bunker complexes and interlocking fields of fire. This was expected to be the first point at which the 269th advance would be checked, but again it was considered a relatively minor obstacle, and so whilst they were being attacked by the lead elements, a formation would be broken off from the 269th and moved over to assault the ruins of a laser defense silo over on the western flank. The laser battery itself was expected to have been destroyed by preparatory bombardments that had occurred over the two preceding months. But regardless of the status of the laser defense battery itself, the fortified tower upon which it squatted possessed a commanding view of the ravine which the 269th was expected to advance down after having destroyed the outer defenses. And whilst most of the automated defense batteries of the tower were expected to also have been destroyed, uh, the Death Corps of Krieg could bring up new guns to replace them, and with the possession of the tower, they would be able to support the advance of the rest of the 269th from a commanding position on the higher ground. Once the laser defense silo had been seized by Death Corps forces, and the two outlying armored towers as well as their bunkers had been disabled and occupied, the thrust would then continue down the ravine itself. This was where the bulk of the fighting was expected to happen for the first day of operations. And yes, all of this that we've talked about previously was expected to be achieved in a single day. And then, on day two, the 269th would continue down the ravine, where it would encounter a fortified gatehouse flanked by twin armoured towers. This was also the first point at which the 269th would be fully exposed to the Citadel's own guns. By advancing from the northeast in the direction of the knocked out laser defense battery, Lord Hector Rex had chosen his axes of approach very carefully. It would minimize the amount of fire that the Citadel itself was able to pour into his attackers, but once the 269th was fully dedicated to their assault upon the ravine itself, they would begin to be exposed to plunging fire from multiple directions, and so it was imperative that the Death Corps clear the ravine as quickly as possible, and so that was the objective for the second day. And to aid in the speedy capture of the objective, this was also where Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex would play his trump card. The Red Hunter's Astartes. And this part of the plan bore a striking resemblance to an operation carried out by the Red Scorpions previously in the campaign, where they seized a breach in the curtain walls by first sending in a small lead squad of assault marines, who, upon placing a teleporter beacon, was reinforced by First Company Terminator elites, who then secured and held the breach point until they could be reinforced by conventional troops, both from the Death Corps and from the remainder of the Red Scorpions contingent, racing towards them in armoured personnel carriers. In this case, however, there would be no advanced force. There would be no teleportation assault because the Red Hunters did not possess adequate numbers of teleportarums, and inserting a small force behind the gates was expected to be little more than outright suicide. Instead, 150 Battle Brothers would be deployed via drop pod, along with four Inquisitors possessed of specialized power armor to allow them to survive the insertion method. As any unprotected human deployed to the battlefield from orbit in what is little more than a steel coffin with a pair of massive jet engines mounted on the bottom, tend to result in the transformation of aforementioned human into a strange strawberry-like jam substance which subsequently reduces their combat ability quite significantly. And combat ability was going to be of paramount importance. This force would be effectively cut off from any future reinforcements, 
by a massive fortified gatehouse, which the Red Hunters Astartes would have to seize in conjuncture with the 269th, making a concerted push along with their deployment up the ravine. The plan was to attack the gatehouse from two directions at once, and therefore overrunning it swiftly and effectively. Utilising both the constant pressure from without by the Death Corps and the sudden brutalising shock of the arrival of the Red Hunters to break open the defensive line and then both formations, using the Astartes as a spearhead, would race onwards towards the lower armoury gates whereupon Death Corps engineer elements would be brought up along with specially designed breaching charges, which would be used to blast open the gates themselves and allow the 269th and the Red Hunter Astartes, along with Inquisitors and their retinues, access into the lower armories and therefore also the bowels of the Citadel. From there on, the Death Corps could simply flow into the Citadel's lower structures and begin tearing apart the whole fortress from the inside out, thereby circumventing the need to take the heavily fortified and defended walls. It would also give the 88 the advantage of potentially seizing upon the enemy's stockpile of ammunition and weaponry, as it was theorised that these were still primarily stored in the main armoury located right beneath the citadel, and whose entrance was commanded by the very armoury gate breached by the operation. And as a final benefit, command of the lower levels of the Citadel would also ease the mining operations currently being carried out towards the Citadel's undercrofts. Right from the very beginning of the siege, Lord Hector Rexes had taken a page out of Marshal Arnim Kagori's playbook, and large-scale mining operations were already underway, but they had stalled. Enemy countermines created by men, now long since used to the rigours of underground warfare, had imparted severe delays upon the breakthrough into the Citadel's undercroft, and any true entrance was not expected for at least another six months. But if the 88th could gain entry to the lower levels through the armory, then that would severely impact the enemy's ability to counter mine, and in a short period of time then, underground tunnels could be dug from the 88th current position and into the undercrofts, which would allow future reinforcements to stream directly into the citadel itself without having to brave an above ground passage exposed to the citadel's main guns. All in all, seizing control over the lower armory gates held a host of benefits for the 88, and if the entire operation could be carried out in a mere two days, as the Lord Inquisitor was confident that it could, then it would become an astounding success for the 88th Inquisitorial Siege Army, and by all accounts, a war-winning move. There was, however, one itsy-bitsy problem, which some of the officers more acquainted with Varax may have raised if they were not from the Death Corps of Krieg. A good Krieg guardsman does not doubt his superiors, no matter how interesting a take they may have on a given situation. If, however, these were officers from another, more liberal regiment, they may have pointed out to the Lord Inquisitor that the plan seemed to rest entirely upon the enemy being so cooperative as to simply stop fighting at certain intervals to allow the advance to continue unhindered, and that it also relied upon the enemy not realising that the lower armoury gate was an extraordinarily vulnerable and also valuable objective for their besiegers. And if they felt particularly impertinent on that particular day, they might also point out that simply assuming that the enemy would not be defending a natural barrier such as the gully, which the 269th would have to cross, might also by some be considered to be overly optimistic, perhaps. But, of course, this is the Death Corps of Krieg, and theirs is not to question why, theirs is but to do or die. And so, 
Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex rubber-stamped the final preparations for the plan. The 269s moved into position, and as they would be counted upon to make a swift advance, they would be supported by several other formations, including two full Death Rider companies and further companies standing ready to pour past the 269th and into the armories once the gates had been breached. But, just like with the advance of the 261st, these forces would only be released in truly dire circumstances or once a breach had been secured. Until then, the 269th and the Red Hunters were on their own. But first, of course, as always, a light sprinkling of high explosive destruction. Today's course of bright, flashing lights and loud noises would be directed by the Inquisitor personally, as he had some very specific ideas of what needed bombarding and what didn't. First and foremost, the natural gully that the 269th would have to cross was, as the Lord Inquisitor suspected, only held by light enemy forces, and would be overrun in the first few hours of the offensive and so it would only receive the occasional shower of light explosives, whilst the two fortified towers at the entrance to the ravine would receive the main course of today's bombardment, being showered with a generous portion of both high explosive and delayed action rounds, in the hope that these particular packages would bury their happy little way through the roofs of bunkers and perhaps even an armoured tower or two, and detonate merrily within the centre of these structures, bringing joy and peace everlasting to their occupants. And least we forget the ruined laser defence silo. Since it too was expected to be lightly held and be little more than a secondary objective, it would be granted a light showering, but no more. As the primary peril on that side of the battlefield to the light infantry forces dispatched to take the ruined laser defense silo was expected to be the climb rather than enemy interference. And I can only imagine the artillery officer happily nodding along with the Lord Inquisitor's instructions. Yes, sir. Most certainly, sir. The Vanaxians would not be so uncouth as to interfere with our lads' climbing exercise by doing something so uncouth as shoot at them. And so, with the fire plans laid out in the same optimistic fashion as the entire assault, the preparatory bombardment began. The natural gully which the 269th was expected to cross in a mere two hours was only bombarded by the regiment's own light artillery pieces, primarily thud guns. The only other artillery attention it would receive was smoke rounds dropped in the path of the 269th advance to shield them from whatever light elements were present in the gully. The lead elements of the regiment would be primarily infantry with some armoured support, with Lehman Russ main battle tanks advancing alongside the infantry platoons to provide close range fire support. The Gorgon heavy assault transports along with the bulk of the Lehman Russ main battle tanks and the super heavy armour would be kept in reserve and only brought up when it was time to assault the enemy's main fortifications and the armoured towers. For the infantry, the offensive started off surprisingly well as they exited their trenches and began to advance across the open ground ahead of the natural gully. Very little, if anything, was shooting at them for the time being, and it even appeared as if maybe, just maybe, the artillery officers were finally correct, having spat out the usual diatribe about how the infantry could this time, honest to god emperor I swear it, advance in the face of little to no opposition, after the boys with the big guns had cleared out all of the bad guys. But yet, of course, the humble guardsman is more than able to recognise a serving of bullshit with a side portion of white lies when he sees it, and this particular cause had been served to them with such frequency over the last 18 years that most in the 88 knew it better than their own mothers. But faced with the apparently unarguable absence of incoming munitions, some of the younger elements of the advance party was tempted to believe that this time, finally, the artillery officer's plum pudding of lies contained a kernel of truth. 
So the older and wiser guardsmen allow the younger generation, buoyed up by their newfound optimism, to take a step or two out in front of them. To truly relish the newfound experience of advancing without opposition after having been told the guard emperor's honest truth by their superiors. And so that when young Peter the Optimist got splattered across the face of his elders in a shower of blood, guts and gore, it would allow his more senior members of the 88 to close with the enemy and take out their hatred of all artillery officers on the bad guys, who to everyone's undiminished shock and surprise had not been dealt with by the boys with the big guns. And on this particular occasion, the mistake was considerably more profound than usual. What on the various planning maps had been presented as a relatively shallow gulch which could be overrun easily and with little resistance and a place in which the enemy would be foolish to place any considerable quantity of troops was in reality a fairly deep and complex series of gullies, many of which with very steep embankments on the northern side. So steep indeed that any Lehman Ross attempting to get down the embankment and up the other side ran a severe risk of tipping over. Additionally, the embankments were both tall enough and solid enough to allow the enemy to bury into their sides, creating makeshift shelters that were highly resistant to artillery bombardment, inside of which the Vraxians could hide. These shelters were of a somewhat makeshift and improvised nature and would probably have stood up quite poorly to a concentrated and lengthy heavy artillery bombardment, but they were more than able to stand up to the light scattering of thud gun ammunition that rained upon them in preparations for the infantry assault. And so, the poor buggy guardsmen that got over the top reassured for the umpteenth time that this time the enemy really wouldn't be there they had to try and dig them out as usual. Unfortunately, not only had Imperial High Command overlooked the fact that what was supposed to be a single, not particularly deep gully was instead a quite deep and complex series of gullies, they had also quite severely underestimated the quantity of bad people occupying said gully, as the advanced elements of the 269th found themselves faced with downright murderous fire from heavy weapons and small arms. Whilst the armoured elements attempting to support the infantry reported that they were receiving enfilade fire from heavy anti-tank weaponry, with several Lehman Rosses knocked out and burning within a few minutes of fire being opened upon the column. The Vraxians had patiently waited for the enemy to get nice and close before opening up a murderous fire at a virtually point-blank range, shredding the lead infantry platoons and knocking out several Lehman Russ tanks. The remaining Krieg armoured elements began withdrawing slowly in an attempt to avoid the fate of their comrades, whilst attempting to engage the enemy armour but unable to locate them. The Vaxians, unlike Imperial High Command, had detailed the entire extent of the gully system and had prepared tank positions all along the rim of the gully, allowing their tanks to move into hull down positions, pop off a few shots, then immediately reverse away down a pre-prepared ramp and into the gully itself, where it could then rush up or down the gully to another pre-prepared position, where it could pop up exposing only its turret, knock out and another Imperial vehicle and then repeat the process of relocating. This also convinced the lead armoured elements that they were up against a far larger enemy tank force than they really were. In reality, the Vaxians had only committed a fairly small armoured element to the gully, whilst considerable infantry forces had been committed alongside them. But the erroneous report suggesting that there was a large armoured element in the gully made Imperial Command release heavy assets earlier than planned, and three Macarius heavies were ordered up to take a lead of the Lehman Russ elements that had temporarily withdrawn. The hope was that the Macarius heavy tanks would be able to bully their way forward whilst ignoring the majority of the enemy's anti-tank weaponry, then gain entry into the gully and open up a path for the remainder of the Lehman Russ tanks to follow them in afterwards, and then the infantry, which would at this point have resumed their advance after having been forced to seek cover after their armoured elements retreated, could then pour in behind the armour. 
Unfortunately, only the first part of that plan proved to be practical. The Macarius Heavy's armored protection was more than enough to withstand the enemy's anti-tank weaponry, as repeated impacts whined harmlessly off its over-armored bulk. But upon finally reaching the lip of the gully, the crews quickly realized that if they were to try and drive their morbidly over-armored hippopotamus of a tank down such a slope, they would end up as little more than filling in a mangled steel sandwich. And as the Macarius tanks were driving up and down the lip of the gully, trying to find some area they could descend without flipping themselves over and being crushed beneath the weight of their own armor, one by one they were disabled by demolition charges. With Vraxians able to run straight up to the armored behemoths, unsupported as they were by close-in infantry, and blow off their tracks. After which, the Macarius tanks became stationary pillboxes that were eventually either destroyed by yet more demolition charges placed directly upon the armored vehicles themselves, or overrun by screaming hordes of zealot Vraxians, clambering atop the armored bulks of the Macarius heavy tanks and tearing open hatches with detonation charges or las burners before dragging the crews out into the air and dismembering them one by one. As for the infantry that was supposed to be providing the close-in defense, they had their own problems to worry about. After the lead platoons got shredded by close-in surprise fire, the rest threw themselves to the ground and sought what cover and concealment they could find, whilst attempting to close in on the enemy's defences. But the enemy were prepared for an infantry assault, and soon thereafter, a mortar barrage began plowing up the ground around the advancing infantry, and with precious little concealment and even less cover, their piecemeal advance soon ground to a complete halt, as each guardsman desperately sought out whatever safety he could in the feature terrain. The men of Krieg were not afraid to die, but getting up and advancing now would be certain death, and even worse, it would be a pointless death. Until the armored elements could be brought up once again to suppress the enemy, the death court of Krieg was nothing more than so many targets slowly crawling across the ground towards the gully. And with the destruction of the Macarius heavy tanks, the armor could do little more than withdraw once again, leaving the infantry to their fate. Stimmied by what was supposed to be a minor obstacle, Imperial Command dithered. This was not at all part of the plan, and sending in further reinforcements now would blunt the attack against the real objective of the first day. But on the other hand, if they could not even overcome the gully, then there would be no assault upon the primary objective. And so, eventually, further infantry companies were ordered forward to join in the attack. The first lead formation was then allowed to fall back, bruised and battered as it had been. But the second wave of infantry made no real progress. The attack had been poorly planned and poorly executed, simply due to the fact that the gully was not supposed to have been an obstacle at all and so planning a detailed attack upon it had simply not been considered necessary. The assault upon the ravine had been planned out in excruciating detail, but at this rate, they would have to revise those plans to include the gully as well. As night fell on the first day of fighting, the 269th had not even crossed the very first natural obstacle on their path towards the ravine. And naturally, this meant the plans for the second day would have to be revised. The Red Hunters were instructed to stand by and that there would be no deployment on the second day of the conflict as it had originally been planned. Instead, the heavy artillery batteries would be retargeted against the gully, and on the second day, it would be overrun by massed infantry formations with additional armored support. But the delay had already forced some changes in the plan. The 16th Company, which was supposed to be kept back until the gully had been taken and then launched against the ruined laser defense battery, now found itself leading the second assault alongside another company-sized formation, whilst the 3rd Company, who had led yesterday's attempt upon the gully, was reorganizing since it had lost close to 70% of its officer cadre during the opening surprise barrage fired from the gully, 
as the officers were almost all congregated in the lead elements of the attack, expecting to set up headquarters in the gully itself. But unlike the first day, the second one was initiated with a far heavier bombardment, with the artillery pieces of the 88th concentrating on the gully and the mouth of the ravine. The heavy barrage proved far more lethal to the Vraxian defenders in their relatively improvised shelters. But as the infantry began moving forward once again, they met stiff opposition just like on the first day, except this time of course, there was no surprise involved. Slowly but surely, the infantry elements, supported by the tanks, began pushing forward and placing each individual area of the gully under fire. Whenever an enemy tank moved into a hull down position, it was difficult for the Lehman Rust commanders to get a precise bearing on where it was, limited as their field of view from inside their tanks were. But the infantry were able to locate the areas from which the enemies were firing and then report those locations back to the batteries at company headquarters. Once an area was marked, the light thud guns would then start hammering down upon the position, and even though a thud gun had little chance to knock out a main battle tank, it could make life extraordinarily interesting for the commanders of the Vraxian armoured elements, and by and large they would wish to avoid any area constantly being slammed even by light ordnance because you never knew when your number was up and one of those mortar rounds would come crashing down the commander's hatch. And now that the armour had less to worry about from the enemy's anti-tank weaponry, it could move up and support the infantry effectively, which in turn led to the 16th company breaking into the gully and engaging the enemy with las blasts, bayonets and hand grenades. Swiftly followed by the second company-sized formation, the Death Corps was fully embroiled in a fight for the gully, but they were making precious little progress. The 16th company attempted to make for the battered laser defense silo, which was still their primary objective, but after having suffered heavy casualties amongst the lead platoons just approaching the gully, their assault upon the laser defense battery was badly understrengthed. The original plan called for the light artillery pieces of the 269th to have been brought into position and able to support the attack of the 16th company, but as it was, they not only had to attack the laser defense battery whilst under strength, but they would have to do so without the support of the thud guns. The result of such an effort was a foregone conclusion, yet nevertheless the Death Corps does not back down from an objective just because it's impossible. They had their orders and by the God Emperor they would follow them to the letter. And so the 16th company did indeed make an attempt upon the laser defense battery, and it was repulsed with just the kind of ease that had been expected. Seeing that any further attempts upon it would merely be throwing good men away, the 16th made no further attempts upon the battery, for whilst they had been ordered to make an attempt upon it, they had not been ordered to keep going until they were all either dead or successful. And so, in this case, where those were the only two options, and one considerably more likely than the other, there was no point in continuing the offensive. The second company size formation, having entered the gully, failed to make any real progress either, and both companies were eventually repulsed and had to withdraw back across no man's land. The objective that was supposed to have been taken in the first few hours of the offensive would require a third try on the third day. But now that the gully had been broken into, the reason for the 88th's trouble had become apparent. The Steel Brothers of the Iron Warriors had chosen this particular geographical area to make their home, and they had fortified it with all the arts available to the Iron Warriors, and then filled it with the refuse from the Citadel itself. Mutants, beastmen, and renegade Vraxians, all under the iron-fisted control of their Chaos Space Marine overlords. Imperial High Command had been correct in that the gully was lightly held by Vraxian forces, but unfortunately they had not taken into consideration that now there were far more than Vraxians on Vrax. 
On the bright side, the presence of the Iron Warriors in the gully made it clear to Imperial High Command that it was no mere natural barrier that could be crossed with little effort. And so, considerably greater forces would be deployed against it on the third day of the offensive. And this time, there would be no more half measures. Virtually the entirety of the 269th, except for forces engaged in diversionary attacks elsewhere, who at this point were hardly overly diversionary anymore, but the Lord Inquisitor in his infinite wisdom demanded that they be kept up, just in case I suppose. The initial bombardment was heavier than before, all concentrated on the gully itself, followed in by infantry carried in gorgon heavy assault transport and flanked by super heavy armoured bane blades and Macarius heavy tanks, followed in by a phalanx of Lehman Rust tanks. This time the Iron Warriors were nowhere to be found. Never overly fond of ground that no longer serves their purpose, the Steel Brethren no doubt had already retreated inside of the ravine, but the gully was still filled to the brim with renegades, mutants and all manners of monstrosities which put up stiff resistance against the advancing Krieg armour. They may no longer have been supported by their Chaos Space Marine overlords, but they were still occupying positions that had been constructed and planned out by the foremost defensive siege experts in the galaxy. And it took a full day for the Death Corps to finally winkle out all traces of resistance. It took so long that no further attempts could even be made upon the laser defense battery on their flank which was, for the time being, still able to pour fire into the gully, along with the wall guns mounted on the distant citadel. But finally, after three days, the objective that was supposed to have been conquered within hours on the first day was in Krieg hands. The ground had, however, been bought at an extreme premium, having been turned into an absolute killing ground by the Iron Warriors and even more so by the Citadel guns able to fire unobstructed into the enemy as they advanced up to the gully and then down the slope facing straight towards the Citadel's armaments. But at least the 269th was finally in a position to begin its assault upon the strong point at the mouth of the ravine. But unfortunately, the element of surprise the regiment was somewhat counting on to overrun the outer defences had long since been spent, and with the attack far, far behind schedule, no sizable preparatory bombardment would be allowed either, as the Lord Inquisitor insisted that an attempt be made upon the fortifications as soon as practical. He had been forced to contact the Chapter Master of the Red Hunters twice already, ordering him to stand down his Battle Brothers, and both the Lord Inquisitor and the Chapter Master's patience were beginning to run out. But regardless of the lack of composure on behalf of the Inquisitor, the move into the ravine would be no easy task as it was made clear from the very first attempt upon the outer strongholds that the Steel Brethren had been at work here as well. The entire ravine had become one massive, monstrously intricate network of bunkers, firing positions, mortar pits, trenches, tank traps, barbed wire, minefields and murder holes. And once more, Imperial High Command had misread the lay of the land. They had expected a simple ravine, with walls of rock rising up to either side, but reality was quite different. It had been dug out by lava streams in Vrax's ancient past, and these lava streams had left the ravine with vast rock overhangs on either side. These thick layers of natural mountain were more than able to withstand even the heaviest of bombardment, and so provided the defenders with plentiful cover against the Krieg guns. The slog up the ravine was going to be excruciatingly slow and painful, with casualties mounting at a rapidity that was downright disturbing even for Krieg officers, beginning to rival the losses of the 261st during their attempt upon the Citadel. Meanwhile, the attentions of the 269th was split, as the Lord Inquisitor demanded that another attempt be made upon the laser defense battery. This was once again attempted, 
and repulsed just like before. The 269th was bleeding itself dry, and these side excursions did nothing to help it. Additionally, the Lord Inquisitor continued to insist that diversionary attacks be made on other areas of the front line, despite the fact that at this point no amount of diversion could ever distract the Vraxians from the main ravine. And as expected, progress through it was nigh on impossible. Company upon company, including now reinforcements from other regiments, was hurled at it, but again and again they gained precious little ground. Every time a bunker was destroyed, two more opened up, and the situation began to resemble to a frightening degree the early pointless and bloody battles of the 88, where they had ground themselves to a complete stalemate against the massively entrenched positions of the 1st and 2nd defensive line. After the attack's failure on the 4th day, the 5th day began with some very bad news indeed. The attack had expended all of the ammunition set aside for it, and if the guns were to continue supporting the advance up the ravine, then other artillery pieces in the 88th would have to slacken their own firepower. This came at severe cost to the assaulting infantry, since the only things that had been keeping the Citadel's armament at least somewhat at bay up until now was a murderous suppressing fire placed upon the Citadel itself from every available gun in the 88th. But now that that fire began to slacken, as ammunition reserves were redirected from the siege batteries and over to the support guns, the weapons of the Citadel began opening up with greater frequency and greater accuracy, pouring lethal plunging fire into the infantry companies making their way up the ravine. Despite this, on the fifth day, finally a decent foothold was acquired in the ravine, and yet further assaults were ordered against the laser defense batteries, whose remaining guns were now becoming a real thorn in the side of the main advance. This time, the advance upon the laser defense battery would be supported by the Riva Titan Astor Tyrannis. It was a real risk bringing a Reaver this close to the front line, exposing it to the other laser defense batteries of the Citadel that were still operational, and a potential counterattack by Legio Volcanum, who was still at large somewhere on the planet. Nevertheless, the laser defense battery had to be taken, even if its main armament was out of commission, its secondary and tertiary batteries were still tearing vast holes in the infantry platoons making their way into the ravine. But even with the support of the Reaver Titan, no real progress could be made against the objective. Because even as Astor Tyrannis were tearing vast chunks of permacrete out of the fortified structure and silencing batteries as soon as they opened up on the advancing infantry, they were still exposed to the full fury of the Citadel's other guns. If this assault had been carried out on the first or second day, when the batteries on the Citadel itself were suitably suppressed by the 88's remaining artillery guns, there was every chance the assault would have been a success. But now, the light infantry trying to storm their way up the steep slopes and then climb the fortification itself via the help of various siege apparatuses, were exposed plain as day to the Citadel's guns, who swept them off the fortified walls of the tower and the steep slopes time and time again with little apparent effort. And so company after company was poured into the ravine, continuing to be exposed to plunging fire from both the Citadel and the laser defense silo. Small wonder that the guardsmen began to name the ravine the Death Pit. And then finally, on the seventh day of the offensive, the Lord Inquisitor's patience, in which name so many guardsmen had been sacrificed, finally came to an end, and he ordered the Red Hunters Astartes and their four inquisitorial allies to ready themselves for the drop pod assault. Because on this, the seventh day of the offensive, the fortified gatehouse and the ravine beyond it would finally be captured by a consorted effort between the Red Hunters and the Death Corps of Krieg. 
The infantry officers on the ground were informed that this was to be the day, and when they saw the contrails of the Astartes drop pod hammering through the upper atmosphere and down behind the fortified gate, they would push forward, regardless of all casualties and irrespective of any cost. Further companies would be brought up to be used as additional reinforcement when needed, and two full companies of Death Riders would also be deployed to break through the gate the moment it had been captured and make a dash straight towards the lower armory gates. And once again, the plan relied on but one simple thing that the enemy simply packed up their bags and allowed the Death Corps to do as they pleased. Because once again, the Lord Inquisitor's plan was based more upon hope and make-believe than sound tactical judgement. If the Death Corps had not made any progress up the ravine for three full days, they were unlikely to do so just because the Lord Inquisitor dropped 150 Space Marines outside of their reach. For even if the Red Hunters succeeded in seizing the fortified gatehouse, what would that avail the Death Corps? They would now have to throw themselves towards the very same defences they had been unable to penetrate previously. Except this time, the price for failure was even higher than before. But for some reason or another, no one saw fit to bring that objection to the Lord Inquisitor's attention. Or if they did, they did not sway his mind in the slightest. And so, on the seventh day, 150 Battle Brothers of the Red Hunters chapter, along with four Inquisitors, boarded their drop pods and began their journey to a clearing just behind the fortified gates. The drop assault would be led in by Deathwing drop pods. These fully automated variants on the drop pod design was chocked full of weaponry, including assault cannons, heavy bolters, and multiple launch rocket systems, which would blanket the area around the Death Wing in a hail of annihilating fire. And time to perfection, seconds after they ran out of ammunition, the drop pods containing the Red Hunter Battle Brothers would hammer into the ground and disgorge their equally deadly cargo. The surprise was complete. The rearward Vraxian defenders primarily consisted of renegade militiamen and those of the lower orders. The Steel Brethren were either all at the front line or held in reserve, and the Red Hunters swiftly cut down any and all opposition, formed up, and began moving towards the fortified gatehouse. But then, the lead battle brother was struck by a veritable hailstorm of high explosive bolts rocking him back on his heels as the power armor strained to resist the forces now exerted upon it. And seconds later, the rest of the Red Hunters were under heavy bolter fire, as the Steel Brethren rose from concealed positions all around the fortified gatehouse, and weapons mounted on the gatehouse itself swiveled to face the new threat. The Red Hunters had dropped directly into a trap. Any advance to their front was blocked by the Steel Brethren, and the heavy emplaced weaponry of the fortified gatehouse. Their left and their right was filled with positions occupied by Raxian defenders. These positions had, however, been heavily hammered by the Deathwing drop pods, not fully concealed like the Iron Warriors were. They had been used as expendable troops to make it appear as if the defenders had been caught unawares. But the defenders were quickly rallying, and were pouring more and more flanking fire into the Red Hunters. And far above, the monstrous guns on the Citadel began to turn towards the Astartes. And if one listened very carefully, then beneath the staccato noise of the bolters hammering out a steady stream of their own high-explosive shells whose detonations added yet further to the racket, one could perhaps just about hear a low, grinding noise of monstrous armoured doors being slid slowly open. And soon thereafter, a singularly louder and unmistakable noise of a heavy footfall could be heard as a traitor legion Reaver Titan took its first step out from the lower armory gates. And looking upon this colossus twisted god machine, which was slowly powering up its main weaponry, 
the Red Hunter's leader swiftly decided that they were in a less than ideal tactical situation, and calmly requested a status update as to when he could expect the support of the Death Corps. His polite but urgent query was forwarded to the Death Corps commanders leading the assault upon the ravine, who were shocked to discover that the Red Hunters were already fighting, for they had not seen their arrival. The peculiar nature and curvature of the ravine, probably enforced by copious quantities of enemy fire also heading in their general direction, had caused the Death Corps commanders to quite miss the arrival of the Red Hunter drop pods, and so no order to move forward whatever the cost had been given to the forward elements. What then followed was a costly series of queries, both in time and lives, but also an unavoidable one. Anyone who's ever served in any kind of military will probably recognise precisely what happens when one group receives information that it doesn't want to hear. A series of requests for confirmation flew back and forth with both parties asking what exactly the other party was not understanding about the current situation. The Death Corps insisting that they had seen no Red Hunters arrive, and the Red Hunters equally fervently insisting that no, they were really there and boy would they appreciate some of that support they were promised. Because it wasn't just a Reaver Titan who had exited from the lower armory. Swarming around its legs were uncountable hordes of mutants and degenerates who were throwing themselves in endless waves towards the Red Hunters, who responded with disciplined volleys of hammering bolter fire, sending thousands of the twisted creatures screaming into the Immaterium to meet with their careless gods. But of far greater consequence were the Red Armored Giants running at the rear of the pack of the barely human abominations. The berserkers of Kord were closing in quickly, and with all of these fleshy interventions between them and the hammering bolt rounds of the Red Hunters, there was precious little time to thin the rank of the berserkers before they slammed into the Red Hunters line with a crack like thunder when ceramite met ceramite and chain axes and chainsaws lashed out against one another. Swiftly, the whole of the Red Hunters' force, including the four Inquisitors, was swept up in the chaotic melee. The Steel Brethren, meanwhile, content to sit out the close quarter fighting, redirected their attention to the ravine itself, where the Death Corps of Krieg had finally been ordered to conduct their at-all-costs attack. One of the Inquisitors involved in the Red Hunter's strike force having overridden the series of queries and confirmations and demanded the companies be moved forward. And so they did. The Death Corps of Krieg may very well be one of the only Imperial Guard formations in the galaxy that could do what was now requested of them. Move forward without pause, without hesitation, and regardless of the casualties. And to a man, all of the companies currently involved rose to their feet and began sprinting towards the nearest enemy weapon emplacement. The sheer ferocity of the attack took the defenders by complete surprise, and temporarily bereft of the guidance and support of their Iron Warriors masters, the outer defences began to crumble under a wave of Death Corps bayonets. And in amongst this rolling tide of glinting steel, the armoured elements too pushed forward heedless of the danger. Lehman Rush battle tanks rushing forward, firing all guns as swiftly as it could. Macarius heavies rolling forward, careless of what it crushed beneath its treads. And super heavies as well, rushing as quickly as their massive engine plants could carry them. The gatehouse was finally reached by a Shadow Sword, who after several point-blank blasts reduced the gate to nothing more than Molten Slug before itself being destroyed by near point-blank range anti-tank fire. The repeated blasts of enemy LAS cannons finally boring their way through the superstructure and into something vulnerable enough to see the vehicle explode in a massive fireball, claiming the lives of the nearby dozens of guardsmen thronging to get in through the gate. But then, just as the Death Corps had formed a seemingly irresistible wave, they met the Rock of the Steel Brethren, who sallied out from the now molten slag that was once a gate and threw the Death Corps back. 
The guardsmen's bayonets bent and broke upon their power armor, and hundreds of them were cut down every minute by the staccato roar of Volta fire. And in the middle of it all, chainswords rose and fell relentlessly. Combat blades the size of swords flashed out and disemboweled the guardsmen. The entire area in front of the fortified gate was turned into nothing more than a complete charnel house where guardsman after guardsman clambered over the dismembered and mutilated corpse of his comrades to reach the nearest Chaos Space Marine and make an attempt upon his life. But even such holy fury was not enough to overcome the iron wall of the Steel Brethren, whose centuries of experience in royal butchery saw them cut the death core to ribbons, until they had cleared enough space in front of the gatehouse to establish an impassable killing field, raked by every heavy gun and every automatic weapon the enemy possessed. And meanwhile, on the other side of the gate, the Red Hunters were being picked apart, the Berserkers had scattered their formations, and they were now fighting in small groups back to back, falling like brothers. Two of the four Inquisitors had already been cut down, and their mutilated corpses were being carried away from the battlefield as trophies. And yet even still, things could get worse. The spilling of so much Astartes' blood had brought the attention of the beings that had repulsed the 261st. Soon, demons were swarming in amongst the combatants, killing Red Hunters and, occasionally, the other allies as well. Swiftly, the fighting ground was cleared out entirely of mortal combatants, and the fight was entirely between the Red Hunters, making a last desperate stand against both berserkers and demons in ever greater numbers. Fighting constantly and resisting with every iota of skill and discipline they possessed, the Red Hunters began falling back towards the gatehouse, hoping against hope that there would be some way for them to break out of the confinement. Outside, the Death Corps prepared to aid them in doing just that. The two companies of Death Riders that had been kept standing by for a breakthrough were now hurled towards the enemy. Wave upon wave of mounted guardsmen rushed towards the gatehouse as they were racked by an unending stream of automatic fire and high explosives. Uncovered by the armor, who had by and large thrown itself to the very same death as the Death Riders now rode so bravely towards, they could do little more than ride hard, jumping over the corpses of their fallen comrades and their horses as they went, getting killed by the hundreds, then the thousands, then the tens of thousands, until the ravine was so choke full of corpses of men and horses, until not even the biologically enhanced mounts of the Death Riders could traverse the squelching, ever-shifting mountain of death. And even whilst the Death Corps was desperately attempting to reinforce them, the last few of the Red Hunters were overwhelmed and dragged down. Those who were lucky died in the fighting. Those who were not were hauled away to be given over to the sanctified, and then be sacrificed in elaborate rituals where their flesh would be possessed by the chosen demons of their dark masters, after which they would be sent back onto the battlefield to reap the blood of their former brothers as possessed marines. And in their futile efforts to attempt to save the Red Hunters, the 269th had essentially shattered itself upon the Vraxian defences, and the bad news did not even stop there. Whilst another company had been skirmishing in the broken down Manifactorum complexes on the northeastern slopes of the citadel, they had been counterattacked by a large force of Alpha Legionnaires. The company sized formation had been surrounded and attacked from multiple directions by the Alpha Legion, who had infiltrated into the area previously, no doubt reacting to repeated diversionary attacks launched by this company-sized force. They seemed to have near-perfect knowledge of the Guardsmen positioning and their movements. They began herding them together in an ever smaller pocket until virtually the entire company was scattered and divided, whilst completely surrounded from all sides by Alpha Legionnaires. 
Then, each group was slowly picked off one by one until virtually the entire company-sized formation had been destroyed. Once Lord Hector Rex was informed of the full extent of the day's fighting and the result thereof, he finally called off any further offensives against the ravine and cancelled any more planned diversionary attacks. The Lord Inquisitor's luck had run out, and it had come at a steep cost for all those involved. 150 Battle Brothers from a variety of companies dead. More than a tenth of the Red Hunters chapter wiped out in a single engagement. There was little doubt that this would go down as one of the darkest days in the chapter's history, and one in which their faith and loyalty to the Inquisition was sorely tested. And as for the 88, it had continued to pour company after company into the meat grinder. Just the taking of the gully had cost the 269th close to a third of their total fighting power. The assault on the outer defences of the ravine had cost them considerably more, and as they were continuously reinforced by yet more companies from other regiments, the casualties rose ever skywards, culminating in that seventh and final day, when the desperate attempts to relieve the Red Hunters had come at an astronomical butcher's bill, and all completely for naught. Nay, not for nothing, for even less than nothing. For when we factor in the loss of a complete company carrying out diversionary assaults, the 269s had been reduced from 125,000 men to the size of but a single understrength company. The regiment had been so sorely battered that the fate that had awaited the 261st, that of being rolled into the other regiments in the 30th Line Corps, was not even considered for the 269th. There simply was not enough men left to be worth the reorganization. Instead, the pitiful remains of the regiment were ordered to occupy and repurpose the outermost defences of the ravine, turning them into strong points from which to defend against any attempted enemy sally in the future. But of course, it wasn't just the 269th that had bled in the ravine. Several other companies from several other regiments had also been fed in piecemeal to replace the casualties sustained by the lead regiment. And then, of course, there were the two Death Rider companies who had been rushed down the ravine to try and break through the gate after the infantry had failed just in front of it. Out of these two companies, totaling some 40,000 riders, less than 5,000 survived. And when the various quartermasters from the different regiments were finally finished, making their books, totaling their losses, and crossing out the numbers, it was made clear that well in excess of a hundred thousand guardsmen had been killed in seven days of fighting, and more than triple that number wounded. This meant that over the course of a mere seven days, almost a fourth of all the infantry manpower deployed in the line corps of the 88th Inquisitorial Siege Army had been either killed or incapacitated, permanently or otherwise. Once upon a time, these were the kind of casualties that the 88th not only could absorb, but would quite easily absorb as well, but those days were long past. Now, casualties of this magnitude would be used against the Inquisitor for everything they were worth, and with reinforcements growing ever more scarce from Krieg, additional infantry and armoured elements were not necessarily easy to come by. This was not the kind of battles that the Inquisitor could afford to carry out for long. He would have to go back to the drawing board and find some other way to approach this, for if the 88th had a repeat of this battle, then the entire victory, however inevitable it once seemed, might be put into severe jeopardy. And with that, we're wrapping up yet another episode of The Siege for Vrux. 
A nice fat long one this time, and there's still a little bit more to go. A small bit of a postscript, because at this point I have a sneaking suspicion that this book, and especially this section, was written by commission, as during this portion it is mentioned immediately after the failure at taking the ravine and the annihilation of an entire company that the 269th is also supporting Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex's own assault upon the Lower Gate Spurs. The problem with that, of course, is that now the 269th, which only has four fighting companies, has deployed something along the lines of eight companies, several of which have been mauled so badly that they are no longer combat effective. It's a bit of a clear continuity problem, especially as at the end of the ravine attempt, it is even mentioned that the 269th was so reduced that the remnants of it was relegated to defensive duties. It's almost as if the two authors picked the same company name without actually consulting with one another, or maybe they just got the numbers horribly wrong, which, to be fair, wouldn't be the first time. The first book was relatively consistent with the deployment of company sized formations, once you had adjusted for the numbers, cause well, they were mentioning attacks of millions of soldiers whilst only actually sending in one or two companies, and of course if these companies were regular strength, that would amount to a couple thousand men, and yet the book seems to suggest that there are waves upon waves upon waves of infantry being sent in by the millions. Now I already explained this in the, uh, I think it was the 88th Army video, it's been so long I can barely remember, that I've modified the numbers to make more sense with the book, but at this point we're beyond that. <laughs> the 269th is able to attack basically the whole citadel whilst having several entire companies eradicated, with one being outright destroyed instantaneously, a, a company by the way that the book claims consisted of 700 men. Which, by extension, would mean that both assaults upon the Citadel by the 261st and 269th numbered no more than 3,500 men each. And considering the book also specifically mentioned that the plan organised by Lord Commander Julka required for millions of men in way of assaults, yeah, uh, the numbers and the continuity at this point is all over the place, and so I've chosen to do it slightly differently. I've talked about now the attack upon the ravine itself, and then I will split off the other attack upon the lower gatespur as a another account entirely, because at least that way it makes, you know, sense in a timeline perspective. Okay, the overambitious attack upon the armory failed, so now he's going to try for a little bit more of a limited objective. That makes sense. Or at least in my mind it makes a hell of a lot more sense than a single regiment consisting of three and a half thousand men and four companies, combat companies, but apparently, which actually consists of eight companies, attacking all across the battlefield in the face of god only knows how many hundred iron warriors and cornered berserkers, not to mention the Vraxian defenders, which still numbers in the tens of thousands, mind you. But anyways, as usual, when I make these adjustments I do try to let you know at the end, so take it for what you will. I have certainly adjusted the numbers in this one, and also the continuity a bit as well, because frankly, the way it is written too, if you have the book you probably know what I'm talking about, it is written as if the Lord Inquisitor himself is watching one assault whilst carrying out another assault, but the problem with this is he is literally on a different side of the citadel, there is actually no way he could see the assault being carried out on the ravine, whilst also being in a position to see and then join in the attack against the lower gate spur, unless he was hovering in mid-air somewhere above the ruined laser defense battery, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then. Have a good day.